Hi, it's listening section, uh, section one. Good morning, Sheraton Festival box office. How can I help you? Oh, hello. My family and I are on holiday in the area, and we've seen uh, some posters about the festival this week. Uh, could you tell me about some of the events, please? Of course. First of all, are there still tickets available for the jazz band and on Saturday? There are, but only about 15. The pound 12 seats have all been sold. Okay, and the venue is the school, isn't it? Yes, uh, that's right, the secondary school. Make sure as you don't go into the primary school by mistake. And there is an additional performer who isn't mentioned on the uh, posters. Uh, Caroline, Caroline Hart is going to play with the band. Oh, I think I've heard her on the radio. Uh, doesn't she play the oboe or a flute or something? Yes, the flute. She usually plays a bit symphony orchestras. And apparently, uh, this is her first time of a jazz band. Uh, well, I just certainly like to hear her. Uh, then uh, the next thing I want to ask about is the duck races. I saw posters beside a river. What are they exactly? Well, uh, you buy a yellow plastic duck, or as many as you like, and they are a pound each. And as you write your name on each one, and there will be uh, several races, depending on the numbers of ducks uh, taking part. The John Stevens, a uh, champion swimmer who lives locally, is uh, going to start the races. All the ducks will be launched into the river at the back of the cinema, then uh, they float along the river for 500 meters as far as the railway bridge. And um, uh, are there any prizes? Yes, the first duck in each race and to arrive at the finishing line wins its owner free tickets for the concert on the last night of the festival. Uh, as you said, uh, you can buy a duck. I'm sure my children will both want one. They are on sale at a stall in the market. You can't miss it. It's got an enormous sign showing a couple of ducks. Okay, I'll uh, go there this afternoon. I remember walking past uh, three there yesterday. Now, uh, could you tell me something about the flower show, please? Well, admission is free and the show is being held in Bytheweight Hall. Uh, sorry, how do you spell that? B-Y-T-H-W-A-I-T-E. Bytheweight. Uh, is it easy to find? I am not very familiar with the town yet. Oh, you won't have you don't you won't have any problem. It's right in the center of Sheraton. It's the only old building in the town, so uh, it's easy to recognize. I know it. Uh, I presume it is open all day. Yes, but if you'd like to see the prizes uh, being awarded to for the best followers. You will need to be there at 5 o'clock. The prizes are being given by famous actor Kevin Shepless. Uh, he lives nearby and gets involved in a lot of community events. Gosh, uh, I've seen him on TV. Uh, I definitely go into the prize giving right. I've seen a list of plays that are being performed this week, and I'd like to know which are suitable for my children and which ones my husband and I might go to. How old are your children? 
5 and 7. What about the mystery of Muldoon? That's aimed at 5 to 10 years, 10 year olds. So if I take my children, I can expect them to enjoy it more than I do. I think so. If you'd like something for yourself and your husband and uh, leave uh, your children uh, with a babysitter as uh, you might like to see fire and flood, uh, it is about it is about events uh, that really happened in Shilton uh, 200 years ago and the children might find it rather frightening. Oh, thanks for the warning. The, and, and finally, uh, what about Silly Sailor? And that is a comedy, and it is for young and old. In fact, it won, it won an award in the Shelton Drama Festival a couple of months ago. Okay, well, uh, goodbye, and uh, thanks for all the information. I am uh, looking forward uh, to the festival. Goodbye. Section 2. Good morning and welcome to the museum. I am one uh, with a remarkable range of exhibits uh, which I am sure you will enjoy. My name is Greg and I will tell you about the various collections as we go around. But before we go, uh, let me uh, just uh, give you a taste of what uh, we have here. Well, for one thing, uh, we have a fine collection of 20th and uh, 21st century paintings, many by a very well, very well known artists. I'm sure as you will recognize uh, several of the paintings. Uh, this is the gallery that attracts the largest number of visitors, so it is best to go in early in the day before the crowds arrive. Then uh, there are 19th century paintings. The museum was opened in the middle of the century. The several of the artists each donated one work uh, to get the museum started, as it were. And so uh, they are of special interest to us. We feel closer to them uh, than unto other works. The Sculpture Gallery has a number of exhibits, but I'm afraid it is currently closed for refurbishment. Uh, you will need to come back next year to see it properly, but a number of sculptures have been moved to other parts of the museum. Around the World is a temporary exhibition and you have probably seen something about it on the TV or in the newspapers. It is creating a great deal of interest because it uh, presents objects from every uh, continent and many countries and it provides information about their uh, social context, why they, why they were made, uh, who for, and so on. Then uh, there is the collection of coins. This is what uh, you might call a um, focused specialist collection because all the coins come from this country and uh, were produced between uh, 2000 and uh, 2000 and 1000 years ago. And many of them were discovered by ordinary people uh, digging their gardens and donating into the museum. All our porcelain, all our porcelain and glass was left into the museum by its founder when he died in 1878. And in the items of his will, uh, we are not allowed to add anything to that collection. He believed it was perfect in itself, and we don't see any reason to disagree. Okay, uh, that was something about the collection, and now I uh, here is some uh, more more practical information uh, in case you need it. 
Most of the museum facilities are downstairs in the basement, so you go down the stairs here. When as you reach the bottom of the stairs, as you will find yourself in a sitting area with comfortable chairs and sofas, where as you can have a fast before continuing your exploration of the museum. We have a very good restaurant. Um, which um, uh, serves excellent food all day in a relaxing atmosphere to reach it uh, when as uh, you uh, get the bottom of the stairs go straight ahead into the far side and the sitting area then turn right into the corridor as you will see the door of the restaurant facing you if you just want to want a snack or if you'd like to eat some somewhere with facilities for children, we also have a cafe. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll need to go straight ahead, turn right into the corridor, and the cafe is immediately on the right. And uh, talking about the children, and uh, there are a baby changing. There are baby changing facilities downstairs across the sitting area. Continue straight ahead along the corridor on the left, and you and your baby will find the facilities on the left hand side. The cloakroom, uh, where you should leave coats, umbrellas, and any large bags, is on the left. A left hand side of the sitting area. It is to the last door before you come into the corridor. There are toilets on every floor, but the basement. But in the basement, there are the first rooms on the left. When you get down there. Okay. Now, if you've got anything to leave in the cloak room, please do that now. And then I will start our tour. Now, section three, and this is a conversation um, between the students. Hi, Jonah. Good to meet you. Now, before we discuss our new research project, I'd like to hear something about the psychology study as you did last year for your master's degree. So, how did you choose your subjects for that? Well, I had six subjects, all professional musicians. And, um, and all female. And the three were violinists. And uh, there was also a cello, cello, cello player. And a pianist and a, a flute player. Uh, they were all uh, very highly uh, regarded in the music music world, and uh, they'd done uh, quite extensive tours in different con continents. And uh, quite a, a few had won prizes and uh, competitions, competitions as well. And uh, mm, they were quite uh, young, weren't they? Yes, between 25 and 29, um, the mean was uh, 27.8. Uh, I wasn't especially looking for artists who'd, uh, who'd produced recordings, but this is something that is just taken for granted these days, and they all had. Right. Now, you collected into your data to telephone interviews, didn't you? Yes, I realized if um, I was going to interview leading musicians, uh, it would only be possible over the phone because they are so busy. I recorded them as using a telephone recording adapter. I'd, uh, I'd been worried about the quality, but it worked out all right. I managed at least a 30-minute interview with each project. Uh, sometimes longer. Did doing it on the phone make it more successful? I thought it might. It was all quite informal. 
and though and um, in fact they seemed very keen to talk and i don't think using the font meant i got less rich data rather the uh, opposite in fact interesting and as you were looking at how performers dress for concert performances, that's right. My research uh, investigated the way players see at their role as a musician and how this is linked into the type of clothing they decide to wear. But uh, that focus didn't emerge immediately. When I started, I was more interested in trying to investigate the impact of what was worn on those listening and also whether someone like a violinist might adopt a different style of clothing, uh, clothing from, say, uh, someone playing the flute or the uh, trumpet. It's interesting that the choice of dress is up to the individual, isn't it? Yes, you'd expect there to be uh, rules about it in orchestras, but that is quite rare. You only had women performers in your study. Uh, was, was that because male musicians are less worried about fashion? I think a lot of the men are very much influenced by uh, fashion, but in uh, social terms, the choices they have are more limited, and they just really upset audiences if they strayed away from the narrow boundaries. Hmm. Now, uh, popular music has quite different expectations. And did you read Mike Frost's article about the dress of women performers in a popular in popular music? No. He points out that a lot of female singers and musicians are in um, uh, popular music tend to uh, dress down in performers in performances and wear less feminine clothes like jeans instead of skirts and he suggests so this is because otherwise they'd just be dis uh, discounted discounted as trivial <coughs> <coughs> um, but you could argue i'm sorry my thought for my thought uh, but uh, you could argue and they are just wearing what is practical I mean, a pop music concert is usually a pretty energetic affair. Yes, he doesn't make that point. Uh, but um, I think um, you are probably right. I was interested by the effect of the audience at a musical performance when it came into the choice of dress. The subjects I interviewed felt and this was really important. It's all to do with what we understand by performance as a public event. They believed the audience had a certain expectations and it was up to them as performers to fulfill these expectations to show a kind of esteem. They weren't afraid of looking as, uh, as if they, uh, they'd made an effort to look good. Mm, I think in the past, the audience uh, would have had those expectations of one and the two, but that is not really the case now, not in the UK anyway. anyway. No? No. And uh, I also got interested in what sports um, scientists are doing, what sports scientists are doing too, with regard to clothing. <clears throat> Uh, musicians are uh, quite vulnerable physically, aren't they? Because the movements they carry out uh, are very intensive and repetitive. So I'd imagine some features of sports, clothing and safeguard to players and the players from potentially dangerous effects of this sort of thing. <coughs> 
Yes, but musicians aren't really considered. They are white clothing that obviously uh, restrict uh, restricts their movements, but and um, that's as far as the, they go. Anyway, coming back into your own research, um, do you have any idea where you are going from here? I was thinking of doing a study as using an audience, including section four. As we saw in the last lecture, a major cause of climate change is the rapid rise in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last century. If we could reduce the amount of CO2, perhaps the rate of climate change could also be slowed down. One potential method involves enhancing the role of the soil and that the plants grow in and with regard to absorbing CO2, Ratan Lal, a soil scientist from Ohio, Ohio University, Ohio State University in the USA, claims that the world's agricultural soils uh, could potentially absorb 13% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the equivalent of the amount released in the last 30 years and uh, research is going on into how this might be achieved. Lal first came to the idea that the soil might be valuable in this way, not uh, through an uh, interest in climate change, but rather out of concern for the land itself and the people dependent on it. Carbon rich soil is dark, uh, crumbly, and fertile, and it retains some water. But erosion uh, can occur if a soil is dry, uh, which is a likely effect if it contains inadequate amounts of carbon. Uh, erosion is, of course, bad for people trying to grow crops or breed animals on that terrain. In the 1970s and 80s, Lal was studying soils in Africa so devoid of organic matter that the ground had become extremely hard, like cement. Okay, there he met a pioneer in the study of global warming who suggested that carbon from the soil had moved into the atmosphere, and this is how looking increasingly likely. Let me explain for millions of years, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been regulated in part by our natural partnership between plants and microbes. Tiny organisms in the soil Plants absorb CO2 from the air and transform it into sugars and other carbon-based substances. While a proportion of these carbon products remain in the plant, some transfer from the roots to fungi, or fungi and soil microbes, which store the carbon in the soil. The invention of agriculture some 10,000 years ago disrupted into these ancient soil building processes and led into the loss of carbon from the soil. When humans started draining the natural uh, topsoil and uh, flowing it up for planting, they exposed the buried carbon into oxygen. Uh, this secreted carbon dioxide and released it into the air, and in some places, the grazing and domesticated animals has removed all vegetation, releasing carbon into the air. Tons of carbon have been stripped from the world's soils where it is needed and um, pumped into the atmosphere. So, what can be done? Researchers are now coming up with the evidence that even modest changes of farming can significantly help to 
uh, reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Some growers have already started using an approach known as uh, regenerative agriculture. And this aims to boost the fertility of soil and to keep it moist through uh, established practices. These include the keeping fields planted all year round and increasing the variety of plants being grown. Uh, strategies like these can significantly increase the amount of carbon stored in the soil. So agriculture cultural researchers are now building a case for their use in combating climate change. One American investigation into the potential for uh, storing uh, CO2 agricultural lands is uh, taking place in California. Soil scientist Wendy Silver of the University of California, uh, Berkeley, is conducting a, a first of its kind study on a large cattle farm in the state. She and her students are testing the effects on carbon storage of the compost um, that is created to farm waste and both agricultural, including manure and um, uh, corn stalks, and waste produced in garden, uh, such as leaves, branches, and lawn trimmings. In Australia, uh, soil ecologist, soil ecologist uh, Christine uh, Jones, Christine Jones is uh, testing another promising soil enrichment strategy. Uh, Jones and twelve farmers are working to build up soil carbon by cultivating grasses that stay green all year round. Like composing the uh, approach has has already been proved ex uh, experimentally. Jones now uh, hopes to show that it can be applied on uh, working farms and that uh, the resulting carbon capture can be accurately measured. Uh, it's hoped in the future that projects such as these will uh, demonstrate the role that the farmers and other land managers can play in introducing the harmful effects of greenhouse gases. For example, in countries like the United States, where most farming operations use large applications of fertilizers, Changing such long-standing cabins will require a change of system. Ratan Lal argues that farmers should receive a payment not just for the corn or beef they produce, but also for the carbon they can store in the soil. Another study being carried out 